Now I'll let you kick this one off because I've never been able to successfully defend the clash in a conversation. And nor am I necessarily, um, you know, my entree to the clash is even more embarrassingly 311. Um, they did white man and hammersmith on a tribute record. And that was the first time I'd ever heard a clash song, like kind of knowingly, um, outside of rock the Casbah and what's the other, is there another big one as big as that? Is, is anything on London Calling as big as Combat Rock? I don't know, but I feel like everyone knew about it via the London Calling poster. Yep. Like, that was just it. That was Adapted everybody's... From, oh, yeah. from Elvis Presley. Yep. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of weird cultural things to unpack with all of that. Um, but I, I almost like Know Your Rights just more for the fundamental declaration than any of the nuance and... You know, they, they were really interesting because I think they knew their place as like um, easily tipping into appropriation with with reggae and other forms of black music. Um, and I, I feel like and again, this is a, somebody who doesn't have a deep understanding of the clash that like they were generally pretty respectful of the politics of the things that they enjoyed. Um, and they certainly never shied away from um from a song like know your rights that they, they took really articulate positions on some of these sorts of things. Um, all of the songs in this next block, which we've described as the mobilized block are, are really around, um, marches and protests and, uh, shows of force almost. Right. So you have these ideas in your head, you need to like hit the streets with them. But what I love about this block of songs is, with the exception of the discharge song is like, there is a forward motion. And then by the time you get to the end of this block, a a joy, yeah, you know, like joy as an act of resistance. So you have know your rights by the clash. And then I think probably the biggest discharge song, is there a big discharge song? (laughs) Um, Protest and survive, um, which is, is such a good refrain. It's like, I think that's what a lot of people are doing right now. Um, here in Atlanta, you have the digital magazine, the main line, and they're like every day giving people the information, like here are the politicians you need to call here are the protests and where they're happening today. Um, so God bless the main line and, and the work that they're doing. A, a, like a quick note on this song, cause it's not super complicated, but just putting protest and survive together in the same phrase and then repeating it did help get some things through my skull because I, I think even right now, there are, especially um, no shade for this micro moment here, but even for people who live outside of a city, <laughs> they... No but, one listening to this in a place that's not Atlanta yeah. will be like, oh. But if you're not in a place where literal protests are happening or where there's a density of the problem that is being protested, it's easier to take up the mantle of... I'm not sure I understand why you need to be out there in the streets doing this. Why don't you vote? What, like, why don't you go through the normal channels to make this work? And like, aside from the fact that that takes 30 seconds to systematically dismantle as an idea, just this song, again, tying protest and survive together helps me kind of like recalibrate especially in the flow of these songs like it's sort of like maybe you're on your way to the protest and you're like i'm not sure why i'm doing this like is this is this too much no protest is the way that change has happened here and everywhere all of the time in democracy like protest is the step that happens when systematic voting does not produce the outcome that we need. This is survival for a lot of people. Also the plot of the movie, a bug's life. (laughs) We ride. I love that movie. That was a (laughs) shocking change of pace. I love it. (laughs) That movie's good. Full stop. The bugs are the proletariat. From a bug's life to public enemy, go. So, okay, I can't remember the exact story. Um, the governor of Arizona 
something something you know basically like shutting down the equivalent of a of a black lives matter thing and i'm sorry for being so inarticulate and unprepared to talk about the actual historical context that's your job man do you have the notes i can okay yeah i mean so basically dude was like i don't want mlk day to be a holiday right and but but it's such it's such a good exact moment because it's so indicative of what's happening right now too for people where he he is abstracting out his reasoning into what is probably a technically and legally acceptable argument, which is, I don't believe that we have the right to institute this day in the fashion that it was instituted. Okay. And all like nuanced legal arguments should always be welcome because laws mean things and they have to be specific. But the thing that was missing also (laughs) point point of reference, this was in 1990. This was not a long time ago. Right. Right. And it was right after the federal government made a movement to do this, right? Um, and it did lose a, a ballot proposal. Voting didn't work, right? Basically, Arizona voters came out and said, we don't want to honor MLK. Uh, but like the important thing is when you're calling out the, this shouldn't happen from a legal perspective, there should be the world's largest comma followed by a but, which then follows with, it really matters to me that people are emotionally invested in being able to celebrate a civil rights icon. Here is what we can do instead. That wasn't, there was nothing after that. It was just, I don't want this to be a holiday and I'm not a racist. (laughs) There's your story. (laughs) So then Chuck D is like, I'm about to walk (laughs) my ass to Arizona. (laughs) All the way there. Um, he said, I'm on a one mission to get a politician to honor, or he's a goner by the time I get to Arizona. This is, so like I would put Chuck D in my all time top MCs because he is so singular in the way that like he's barely rapping. He just has a whole like, Faulkner sound and fury stream of consciousness that just happens to hit a cadence and occasionally a rhyme scheme. Yep. Um, I like, I, I don't even know where to, where to hone it. Cause it, it's just like, it's all one big thing, but the, um, the line that I always come back to in this song is what's a smile and face when the whole state's racist. Um, and, Right before that, it says, see people smile wild in the heat, 120 degree, because I want to be free. Uh, I love the sample from this. And it's Simon or somebody like that. It's like a 70s funk group. And it's a really heavy group. And it feels like the heat of Arizona. And it's it like has that weird oscillating. Yeah. Um, and it just has all the funk of like, get out in the street and it has the kind of up and down cadence of a protest march chant. Um, and it was, I always forget that it was about honoring MLK day, um, which is, I didn't even think about that part being so timely with like the Juneteenth conversation. Um, but it's, it's just so furious and focused. And I love the idea of, the way he localized it to one politician or a set of politicians or a political ideology or whatever, like Arizona in 1990 can substitute for Minneapolis in 2020 or Atlanta in 2020 or um, New York city during the Occupy protests a few years ago or St. Louis in the wake of Ferguson. Um, what he does really brilliantly here is honing in on a place and a person and I'm going to change one heart and yeah. mind and policy and then we'll march back on to the other thing because there's a bunch more assholes like this guy out there somewhere. The the two things that I, I love that really drive this thing home to me, first of all, th- that the terrifying bridge in this song is the original walk-on music for the Jackson 5. And screams, human screams, just yeah. giving you that sense. <clears throat> it's of a tension. little death gripsy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but my favorite story about this 
in 91, Public Enemy went on tour with U2, which is, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that is the most Bono thing I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> they opened up for U2. Uh, they played Sun Devil Stadium in Arizona. They hey. played only this song and then left the stage. It's the punkest shit I've ever heard. I can't believe I've never heard that story before. But like to your point of just like, no, 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 this one particular thing. No, no, no. We can do something about this. This was bullshit. And like having, I mean, Chuck D needs no introduction in terms of uh, the excitement with which he is affrontive, I guess. But like just following it through all the way to the edge. No, no, no. We didn't forget about this. This was for you. You literally, and we're not going to forget it, and we're not going to give you anything other than this, and then walked off stage. Like, and what would become the number one party school in America? I mean, yeah. I mean, for, for a song that only ever got played on MTV once and immediately made it to Nightline so tight. because it was so scary, to Bono's credit, someone asked Chuck D in the interview where he's talking about this. They're like, what did Bono do? He's like, he gave me dabs and then hit me in my chest and gave me a high five. I'm like, okay. <laughs> See Bono back there like, we got him, bro. <laughs> U2 is so confounding for me. Agree. And Bono specifically, 99% of the time, it's so easy for me to be like, God, I cannot stand that dude. But then he goes and does one thing and he totally redeems himself. <laughs> Uh, let's segue out of that into an artist for whom I hope there is no debate. There was for a long time. Yeah. Um, but as of the past couple of years, another artist that we have covered and an album, the song is from that we have covered in the main podcast. Um, Riot by Childish Gambino, um, which I love because it samples um, a funkadelic groove that I love, like specifically two little parts of it mm -hmm. right around the middle. Um, and this song is really short. It's the punk song yep. on this record. Yep. Uh, it's a minute and a half or so. But I also love this song because live, it's the song that he lets breathe the most. Yeah. And they play the guitar riff kind of on a loop. And it's where he uses that platform to do the kind of James Brown stage banter thing, but it's always a serious and mystical, very Donald Glover esque thing. It's where he talked about um, like processing the emotions after his father died. It's where he talked about honoring Mac Miller's memory as a great artist and friend to all after Mac died in the show in Pittsburgh. Um, and it's just generally like the moment of contemplation in the show. And he's, you know, Donald is such a, a pensive and kind of melancholy and abstract artist. Like he never puts you directly in the path of the feeling, but he always leads you there kind of on your own. And I think that's why we talk about him in such breathless terms as a, as a society. But I love this one because it's, it is really visceral and it takes on the posture of Sly and the family stone in, you know, there's a riot going on. It's kind of a direct homage to that but it also uses the funkadelic musical palette. Um, but the, the chorus is everyone get down, baby, um, fly high. And that's such a beautiful, like I, I think of him as like the, the dad of multiple kids. Who's the voice of a Disney character and also Lando Calrissian. Mm -hmm. He has such a childlike wonder to the way that he approaches everything. And, to me, like this is when I'm talking about being joyful with the opportunity to protest and resist and just like making the way for a better world is, is the job that we're doing. So it always takes on a negative, hard, challenging connotation when we're talking about hitting the streets and the physicality of all that and a full throated awareness of the enemy that we're up against. But then I just think this song is such a breath of fresh air in thinking about the way that we might riot mm -hmm. or or resist with joy in our hearts. Like, because if they've stolen that, they've stolen everything that we have. You know, if they've stolen our soul, then then we have nothing left. 
And I think that's the gift that Donald Glover gives us as an artist is like, he is truly on this earth to remind us that we're here to be fully realized humans. And that should be the posture of, of your protests. Like your resistance should be your life. Thanks for coming to my TED. <laughs> <clears throat> then you go into long walk to DC, which like, I love that Mavis Staples was on the new RTJ record. Mm. Like Staples singers are, they are sublime. Like they, they were a truly holy thing. Um, and they did that, that thing with gospel music where it was like spooky you know, it, it really like they, they touched the lightning rod that was the Holy Spirit and they brought that out in the way that they sang together. And then you get to the late sixties. I think this, this version certainly that's on the playlist came out in 68. Um, and you know, it's in the wake of Dr. King's death and all, you know, all the marching and all that. Um, but there's such a, like, there's the electric guitar at this point and kind of more of a, a sly stone type of rhythm almost. Um, and there's, there's a clear directive. Um, <laughs> there's a clear directive to like do it no matter what. Um, I got a dime for some coffee. I got a dime to buy me some cake. I got to see the president no matter what it takes. Right. So just remembering like the goal is to affect change with the people in power. And we've seen the symbolic value of a march on Washington again and again and how that has made a difference as recently as the, the women's march in, in 2017. Yeah. Um, but like often it is those who have the least of us who are expending the most energy to do this thing. Um, so if there are people like us who have the privilege to do so, like imagine how much more powerful this could be and how much more change we could affect if we could give resources to people like this that are going to do it come hell or high water, no matter what. Yeah. I think two things uh, are important that I walked away with from, from this song that I think can maybe take us into the next and final block. One is uh, to be a little lighthearted about it. I, I think the story of the walk to DC here in the song is a good way to really understand why people were taking the action that they took. Yes. MLK was assassinated. Yes. They are marching in response to this. Yes. What else could they do? Right? So there's, there's already the sense of urgency. I, I must do something. Um, at, at the risk of being a little too lighthearted, I do think it can help connect with people who don't really understand what was happening or what happens in protests. If you've got some care and energy and you don't feel like you understand why people are fighting about things, you can look at this story as the last time you were upset about something stupid in a store and you said, I need to speak with the manager. And they said, well, I'll go get them, but they might be busy and you're going to have to wait a while. And you sat your ass in that chair and you went, oh, I'll wait. Like the long walk to and then DC. you start texting <laughs> a literal million of your friends. Yeah. And when the manager comes out, they're like, oh, whoa, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Coupons for everyone. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, but it's, it's, it's that energy, right? Of like, no, 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 no. I need to speak to someone about this because this is unacceptable behavior. And like the whole story of this, the long walk to DC, like these aren't just euphemisms. Like the, I have a dime for my coffee and a dime for my cake. These are incapable of buying either coffee or cake. The implication is I am unable to travel efficiently to DC. It matters to me so From much. Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. Right? An, an enormous sacrifice and physical journey. And I will walk across Southern states where I am not welcome to get to DC so I can speak to the manager. Give me the president now. I need to speak to someone about this. Like, I, I think that it really helps us to take some of these stories, especially from the civil rights movement, and remind ourselves that so many of them are literal. Just like we talked about with Strange Fruit, right? 
This is not an abstraction or a painting. This was a real moment. So I think looking at these stories when they're being told in direct ways like this as a real story uh, is really helpful. For me, the line that really sticks out here and, and compelled me to go deep on this one was even for the person speaking in this song, there's a line, should have been going on yesterday, but today I'm leaving here. And I think that that encourages me for the moments where I go, should I have already been doing something <laughs> about this? You know, it doesn't matter. Leave today. Like, like we keep talking about with that sense of direct action, you know, what's right. Just start doing it today. Mm-hmm. Ask for feedback, do it in community so that you do it well, but just start taking chances with kindness and compassion in your heart and pay attention to what people say and find out how you can help better. But the worst thing you can do is to sit back and say, I can't be involved because I don't want to get canceled, be criticized, this sort of thing. If you have kindness and compassion and are in community, you will take the right steps and people will help you. Yep. Um, I mean, it's like an, it's almost like an exercise regimen, right? Like take 15 minutes a day to do a small anti-racist thing. Totally. You know? call your city council person, like do the things that we should have been doing all along, holding people we expect to look out for our best interests, hold them more accountable. Like this is the sea change moment where we start to do something like that and we just make it part of our everyday life. Um, If people made these incredible, like almost hard to believe sacrifices they gave their whole lives for this movement. Like the, the least you can do is take 15 minutes every day to like read and share an article, <laughs> yeah. have a conversation, call your city council person, read about your local budget and how decisions get made around that. Help register people to vote, right? Look out for your elderly neighbors. Like just do one yeah. small thing a day, right? Like that's, that's the whole theory of collective impact is like, if everybody just did what they could from where they are, the world would be a lot better off. And I think we get so paralyzed thinking about the end zone that we like forget to try to get the first down first. Yep. Um, and that's probably the first and last f- football analogy that's going to happen on this podcast. Hail Mary, full of grace. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think... I think we got to start from where we are. It is a long walk to DC, but we better get going today. Yeah.